meeting begins. The board will also do their reorganizational meeting prior to starting their regular meeting where they'll elect a new chairman and vice chairman uh, and some other uh, orders of business. And so without further ado, we'll go ahead with the swearing in ceremonies um, for both uh, the newly elected commissioners, Peter Asciutto and Scott Eford. Um, I would like to call um, the Honorable Judge Bridges forward uh, to um, do the oath of office for, uh, we'll go first with uh, Commissioner-elect Peter Asciutto. So if you would please place your left hand on the Bible, raise your right, and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Peter Asciutto. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and maintain. That I will support and maintain. The Constitution and laws. The Constitution and laws. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution and laws. And the Constitution and laws. Of North Carolina. North Carolina. Not inconsistent. Not inconsistent. Therewith. Therewith. And that I will faithfully that I will faithfully discharge the duties discharge the duties of my office of my office as county commissioner as county commissioner so help me God so help me God I state your name I Peter Rusciuto do further swear do further swear that I will well and truly that I will well and truly execute the duties execute the duties of the office of the office of county commissioner of county commissioner according to the best of my skill according to the best of my skills and ability and ability according to law according to law so help me god so help me god congratulations sir thank you Great. 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 Go. need you to sign You are quite welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you. The next swearing in this evening will be for Commissioner elect Scott Eford, and the Honorable Judge Bridges will do the swearing in ceremony for that uh, for Co Commissioner Eford as well. Congratulations, Commissioner Shuda. You have your own Bible there. All right. You place your left hand on the Bible, raise your mm -hmm. right, and repeat after me. I state your name. I, uh, Scott Eford. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support and maintain. That I will support and maintain the Constitution. The Constitution and laws and laws of the United States. Of the United States and the Constitution and the Constitution and laws and laws of North Carolina. Of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith. Not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully. That I will faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge the duties of my office. Of my office as county commissioner. As county commissioner. So help me God. So help me God. I state your name. I, Scott Eford. Do further swear. Do further swear that I will well and truly. That I will well and truly execute the duties. Execute the duties of the office of county commissioner. Of the office of county commissioner. According to the best of my skill. According to the best of my skills and ability. And ability according to law. According to law. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, sir. Thanks, sir. Have you signed? I got a little mask issue here. You'll be all right. sir you're quite welcome thank you judge bridges for your time this evening you are quite welcome thank you all for allowing me to participate in this ceremony and i wish everyone merry christmas and happy holidays take care
Congratulations, Commissioner Eifer. Uh, our next order of business will be to elect a chairman uh, for the board. Uh, and so I will open up the floor for nominations for the chairman in accordance with North Carolina General Statutes 153A39. Mr. County Manager. Commissioner Eifer. I would like to nominate Commissioner Bill Lawhon for commissioner for chairman. We have a nomination for Commissioner Lawhon for chairman. Are there any other nominations? For the position of chairman. Hearing none, I'll close the nominations and ask for a vote. All in favor of Commissioner Lawhon for be chairman, uh, raise your hand. Two, three. Looks like it's a unanimous vote. And uh, any opposed? I'm seeing none. Congratulations, Chairman Lawhon. Serve as chairman. It's uh, my honor to serve as the commissioner chairman, and uh, I will do the best job I can possibly do, but I promise I'll keep all of you informed of what's going on when I know about it. Uh, at this time, uh, it's the uh, job to elect the vice chair, and we open the floor for Swayant to General Statute 153A-39 for nominations for vice chair. The vice chair would preside over the board in case I am not able to do so. Uh, and the chairman can vote, but the chairman, according to these rules and regulations, do not have the right to break a tie vote when I participate in a vote. So at this time, I open the floor for nominations for vice chair. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'd like to nominate for vice chair, Tommy Jordan. Okay, uh, Commissioner first nominated uh, Commissioner Jordan. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, uh, do I have a motion to close nominations for vice chair? All in uh, favor for uh, Tommy Jordan as vice chair, please, uh, please raise your hand. Yeah, I believe that carried 7-0. Congratulations, Commissioner Jordan. At this time, we need to approve some bonds as a commission. And I ask for a motion uh, to approve the following bonds. Tax Administrator Clinton Swearingen, $100,000, which will expire October 28, 2021. Finance Officer Toby Henson, $150,000, which will expire June 30th, 2021. Register of Deed, Suzanne Louder, $50,000 bond, which will expire December 1st, 2021. Sheriff Jeff Crisco, $5,000 bond, that expires December 3rd, 2022. What's the pleasure of the board of approving these bonds? Mr. Chairman, i make a motion to approve the following bonds. Commissioner Allman made a motion. Do we have a second? Vice Chairman Jordan made a second. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries seven to nothing. At this time, <clears throat> we'd like to open the floor for appointments to boards and committees. And I believe uh, all commissioners uh, have those boards and committees, and let me just name them off and then we'll go from there. 
Uh, there's two commissioners that will be placed on the Economic Development Commission. The Health and Human Service Board, there's two commissioners. The Library Board, there's one commissioner. Airport Authority, there's a member and there's an alternate member. Fire Commission Chair is one commissioner. Senior Service Board is one commissioner. Member of RPO, Rural Planning Organization, is a member and then there's an alternate. There's a member of the Stanley Water and Sewer and there's also an alternate to Stanley Water and Sewer. And then uh, there's a member of the Central Carolina government and an alternate Central Carolina government. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Pending any discussion, can I make a motion to approve the list as presented? I will. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I make the motion that we approve Commissioner Lawhon and Commissioner Barbie for the e Economic Development Commission. Myself and Commissioner e Eford to the Consolidated Human Services Agency. Commissioner Almond to the Board of Trustees. Commissioner e Eford to the Airport Authority member and Commissioner Almond to the Airport Authority alternate. Commissioner Fur to the Fire District Commissioner uh, Commission. Commissioner Barbie to the Senior Services Board member. Commissioner Shudo as the board member on, on the RRPO with Commissioner Lahan as the alternate. Myself on the Stanley Water and Sewer Authority member with Commissioner Fur as the alternate. And Commissioner Shudo on the Central Line County, Go County of Government's board with Commissioner Barbie as the alternate. You are making that as a nomination? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I second that motion. Okay. First and a second by Commissioner Eifert. All in favor of those assignments, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, that list will be available. Uh, and if you need to know, if you're serving on any of these committees and need to know the meeting dates and the times, uh, please see our clerk and she will provide you with, with a list of those meetings and what's expected of each commissioner. At this time, <clears throat> we need to establish meeting dates for 2021. The board will meet on the first and third Monday of each month, except for the month of May, June, July, August, September, and December. And this, this is in your packet. And at this time, uh, the time of the meeting will be at 6 p.m. And the proposed meeting schedule for 2021 is as followed Monday, January 4th, and Tuesday, January 19th. The reason it's on Tuesday is because we're moving it because Monday the 18th is celebrated as Martin Luther King birthday. February, Monday, February 1st and Monday, February 15th. Uh, Monday, March 1st and Monday, March 15th. Monday, April 5th and Monday, April 19th. Monday, May 17th. Monday, June 7th. Tuesday, July 6th, and the reason for that is because of the 4th of July uh, celebration, the 5th is on a Monday, but we're designating the meeting on Tuesday. Monday, August the 9th. Tuesday, July, uh, September 7th, and the reason for that is it's another holiday, and so we're moving it to a Tuesday. Monday, October 4th, and Monday, October 18th. Monday, November 1st, and Monday, November 15th. Monday, December 6th. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Okay, Commissioner uh, Jordan made a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Commissioner Barbie, second. Are there any discussion? Hearing none, let's call for the vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, like sign? Motion carries 7-0. We also need to establish the county holiday schedule for 2021. 
New Year's Day, Friday, January 1st, Martin Luther King Jr., Monday, January 18th, Good Friday, April the 2nd, Memorial Day, Monday, May 31st, Independence Day, July 5th, Labor Day, September 6th, Veterans Day, Thursday, November the 11th, Thanksgiving is Thursday, November 25th, and Friday, November 26th. Christmas holiday would be Friday, December 24th, and Monday, December 27th. Those are the holiday dates for uh, the county employees. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I yes, make a motion that we accept those dates as presented. Commissioner Jordan, made a motion we accept as presented. Do we have a second? Second. Commissioner Furr, second. Any discussion of those dates? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. During any regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners, in order to act in their capacity as Board of Governors for the Greater Baden Water and Sewer District or the Piney Point Water District, may at their discretion recess a commissioner regular meeting and reconvene as the Board of Governors of either of the two entities in order to conduct business matters relating to that entity. That's for information. There's no uh, no vote on that particular announcement. Now, which brings me to the regular agenda for the December 7th meeting, and uh, we've uh, we're going to start this meeting with invocation, like our normal meetings that we normally do and a Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask Commissioner Barbie to lead us in those. Let's all bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together and to conduct the business of the county, and uh, we thank thee for the good health that we are receiving and the blessings you put on us as a board. We hope that you can guide us and direct us in the decisions that we make uh, to the betterment of the people of Stanley County. I also like for you to uh, my anniversary date of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. We need to remember our veterans, uh, those that sacrificed and gave all, and, and those that are with us today. We want you to bless them, Lord, and thank them for everything they've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Commissioner Barbie. If the commissioners would look over the uh, scheduled agenda items, are there any adjustments or changes to this agenda? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion we approve the agenda as presented. Okay, Commissioner Eford made a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Do I have a second? Commissioner Allman, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions about it? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Motion carries 7 0. First uh, item on the regular agenda is the fiscal year 1920 audit presentation. And the presenter is Alan Thompson, who is partner with Thompson Price, Scott Adams and Company. Mr. Thompson. Good evening to everyone. <clears throat> um, you should have a presentation summary right there in front of you. That's what I'm going to go by. Um, if you'd be kind enough to flip over to page one. Um, before I start, I'll say this as well. The, the main reason that you hire us as a firm to perform the audit is to issue an opinion on the financial statements as a whole. We did issue an unmodified report, which is a quote-unquote clean report, et cetera. Uh, 
So everything is good there. And on page one, I'm going to read some headlines to make sure I do what I'm supposed to. No significant audit findings. No difficulties encountered in performing the audit on page two. No uncorrected misstatements. No disagreements with management. Management did provide us with a representation letter dated October 20th. We're unaware that management consulted the outside auditors, accountants, et cetera, and the only findings were technical issues, uh, et cetera. So all is good there. On page four of this uh, presentation summary, I don't claim to know all the key numbers in the report, but what we do attempt to do is pull out some of the numbers that we think you may have interest in and then uh, put the previous four years reports beside of it so that you get a feel for what, when I say fund balance or cash, et cetera, what that number looks like in comparison to prior years, and it's not just a number without a context, if you will. And you see that uh, first number there, total fund balance and general fund at 30761 If you go back to 2016, where it's 22617 you get a feel for where the county has been. Unavailable fund balance at 5966 committed and assigned fund balance at $6.2 million, total general fund expenditures at $70,298,000. Fund balance available as a percentage of general fund at 35.27. And then you see by fund revenues over and under expenses before transfers and contributions. The general fund had a positive 985, the Greater Baden Water and Sewer at a negative 40,000, the West Stanley at 186,000 profit, Stanley County Utility Fund at a minus 609, Piney uh, Point Water District at a minus 4,130, and the airport fund at a million, uh, 148 negative. Depreciation plays a, a part in some of the enterprise funds. The capital contributions, which plays a part in the water, I mean in the airport fund, because you may have, t and every airport that we do has tons of grants, et cetera, they end up adding capital assets, then those capital assets are in turn depreciated which has a significant role in where that comes out every year. Depreciation expense, you can see next by uh, those enterprise funds, by fund. And then you see the cash and accumulated depreciation for the utility funds overall there. And then cash in the general fund, 28,231. You would go back to 16, you see it's 20,522. And you see core cash increase despite the fact that fund balance went down. Part of that is due to uh, fund balance went down a little bit because of transfers out capital projects. You also have a million two that hadn't been recognized as revenue at the end of the year that was um, part of the CARES Act. So it'll be recognized in the succeeding year, but the cash is in the bank. And you see cash in the Greater uh, Baden Water and Sewer at 233, and the Stanley County Utility Fund at a million 261, Piney Point at 351, the airport's 157,000, and the other governmental is 2.6 million, and that has to do with grants, capital projects, et cetera. So it may go up and down depending on where the uh, project is at the time. And then you see the fund balance again by individual funds. Well, again, the uh, general fund at 30 million 761, uh, Greater Baden at 3.7 million, the West Stanley at 1 million 576, Stanley County Utility Fund at 13.7 million, and then Piney Point at 372,000, the airport fund at 19 million 79,000, and the fund balance in the other governmentals a million seven. The, the key point in, in any of the enterprise funds, quote, fund balance or, or net position is not necessarily where the net position or fund balance is because you could have a ton of assets, but what you're trying to do there is generate cash flow. So I think in, in all the funds, including enterprise funds, you're okay, you're in good shape there. We did look at a percentage up, up above, and I didn't make a comment, and I probably should, that 35.27% fund balance available. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I'm sure general statute requires it to be a minimum of 8.33%, which is basically one month's general fund expenditures. And so your fund balance could be rising, but if your general fund expenditures rise faster than the fund balance is rising, that percentage could potentially decline. But overall, I mean, based on where you're at, based on group weighted average, which we'll look at on some uh, charts in just a minute, county's in good shape overall there. You see on the top of page five, property tax rates. 
Uh, same for all five years presented, and you see the collection percentage there. Collection percentage excluding motor vehicles. Uh, we still put that in there. It, it's, it doesn't have the meaning it once did with DMV collecting property taxes on vehicles now. The next two lines, property valuation and levy amounts are there as well. And then you see the debt analysis there. I interesting note, um, you can see where just as your fund balance uh, increased over the period shown here, eight million, your debt decreased by eight million. And obviously I'm rounding here. And then you see your breakdown of your general fund revenues by department and a breakdown of your general fund expenditures by department as well. And if you'd be kind enough to flip over to page five, I'm, I'm sorry, over to page six. Um, <clears throat> at the top of that page, you can see total fund balance in blue and unavailable fund balance in red. Uh, at the bottom of that, you can see the uh, percentage that the fund balance is of expenditures in blue for the county and the group weighted average in red. And basically the county is mirroring its uh, group weighted average there, if you will. And uh, the group weighted average has not been put out for the current year. In page seven, in two pie charts, you can see the cash balances and fund balances uh, there. And then underneath that, you can see the actual numbers Total cash balances being 32861000 and total fund balances being 70980000 On page 8, you see the collection percentages for Stanley County in blue and the group weighted average in red. And on the bottom, you see the property valuations and the levy amounts. <clears throat> on page 9, you see governmental debt versus business type debt in a chart on the top in the pie chart. And on the bottom, you see the uh, breakdown of general fund revenue by percentage, and you see where the avalorum taxes make up about 49.17%, which is why we're always talking about collection percentages. And on the final page, you see on page 10, a breakdown of your general fund expenditures by percentage, public safety being the greatest there, I'm sorry, education being the greatest, and then public safety. Human resources also being a, a big part. Again, uh, if you had takeaways, quick takeaways, um, county got a good report from the audit on the opinion. County's in good shape overall financially. A fund balance increased over time. Debt went down over time. No findings other than technical findings. I'm happy to answer any questions you have of me tonight, but I'm also happy to, to answer any question you may ever have of me. Just feel free to call the office. I'm not in, tell them to give you my cell number. I'll be happy to answer any question you got. And I appreciate you allowing our firm to do the audit. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Is there any questions, Mr. Thompson, answer for you? Any questions at all? Okay. So, uh, would like to have a motion to accept the audit as presented. Commissioner Jordan, do we have a second? Commissioner Allman, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Motion, any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Thank you, sir. At this time, I'd like to recognize David Jenkins, our Health and Human Service Director. He, he's gonna give us a COVID-19 update. Thank you, Chairman Lawhon. Good evening, Commissioners. Hope you're doing well this evening. So just for your awareness, uh, we're having a little IT difficulties. The monitor is out up here, so if you see me squinting at one of these screens, you'll know what's going on there. Hopefully the presentation will come up here in a moment. Move the mouse, okay? We're moving the mouse here. Let's see if that gets that to come up.
Technology is great when it works, right? Okay, so here's our update, um, our local update plan. My goal is just to give you some basic numbers. Um, that's the report that we keep tabulate locally and information from the state as well and kind of give you some information relating to the COVID vaccine that we'll be uh, having delivered hopefully to Stanley County here in the next few weeks as well. So um, obviously feel free to ask questions and I'll do my best uh, to answer any questions you have throughout this pro uh, presentation. So with this slide, I was kind of a <clears throat> channeling my inner Mike Sprayberry and, and just kind of give you an indication of how long we've been in the command center and there down at the health department. That's been since March 10th. As you can see that a lot of time has passed. It seems like it's been ages longer. It's just, it's Groundhog Day every day when you wake up and you're dealing with uh, COVID issues. And like a, a lot of folks in the community, um, our nation, um, we're over COVID-19. We're ready to move on with our lives and get back some sense of normalcy. But I'm sharing this with you to let you know, um, we're st still seeing on average anywhere to 275 to 300 tests are being conducted a day. Uh, the health department itself is receiving anywhere from 100 to 150 related calls to COVID, relating to COVID specifically. Of course, that's on top of our other calls and other uh, business we have to carry on that mandated requirements as a health department. Uh, we're, we're conducting our case investigations uh, Obviously, any of the positives that come in, we're going to, we'll have those uh, that we have to make calls out to. And we have contract contact tracers that are assisting us at the state level. We maintain communication with them. Uh, we keep our Facebook page updated to try to get information out to our public because we get a lot of calls from local businesses and um, folks in the community wanting that information. And we're transparent as possible to share as much as we can uh, as long as we fall within the HIPAA guidance. So still a lot of work going on, and on top of that, we're preparing for vaccine, and we'll get into that a little bit here. So this is a typical Facebook page you'll see um, on our Monday through Friday. We share this. This is a daily update Monday through Friday. So this is the latest numbers that we have from the COVID-19 database as of 12-7 this afternoon. Um, we completed tests as if you look at the left-hand side. That is duplicated, so that includes retest, a lot of the rest, um, rest homes, nursing homes. A lot of those facilities are required if they're in a, an outbreak situation, they'll continually be testing, so you'll see a lot of those numbers. Obviously, it's different from our residents tested, which is about 21,000. So 41,773 is our approximate total test, and that, again, is all positive, negative, and retest, including that number. Positive cases are currently at 3,317. Uh, reinfections are at three, and I'll define what a reinfection is, is someone tested positive, it's been beyond 12 weeks, and they tested positive again. They had no symptoms. They were completely, as far as they were concerned, nothing related to COVID. They were, uh, felt fine. They were, you know, they ended up testing negative. And then 12 weeks later, we had a reinfection, which means they tested positive. So. We have had three of those at this time. Um, active cases, we're currently looking at 454. Those are positives that we're working with in the community that you know, we have to go through and make sure they go through the quarantine isolation process as well. Uh, Recovered is currently at 2,781. Our hospitalizations are up to 22. That's current hospitalizations. And unfortunately, our total deaths are at 82 as of right now for Stanley County. Percent positive is currently at 8.6%. That is a number that we receive from the state on a weekly basis. So just kind of keep that in mind. You'll see some discrepancies in data. Some of the data is lagging. We have some of the data ahead of the state that we actually report to the state. Some data we actually uh, depend on the state to provide us information on. Outbreaks are currently at six. So our outbreaks are going to be related to any congregate settings where someone may stay over, overnight, such as your prisons, your jails. Um, your nursing homes, skilled nursing homes, things of that nature. Clusters more associated with your businesses and your schools, um, restaurants, things of that nature. And that just kind of gives you the transmission type. You ask about unknown. Unknown means we weren't able to make contact with the individual. So we didn't have any information to determine if it was travel, contact, or community related. This is a very busy uh, graph here. I realize that we're currently in week 40, which means this week is just started as of today. So the information has not been updated. 
Um, this graph actually dates back till the week of March 9th. We started you know, keeping up with all the numbers, all the positives, um, most many of the tests that are being conducted, number of deaths associated, percent positive came along during that time. It just kind of shows you some of the trends. If you look at this data uh, dating back to March, a lot of that is if we had the actual dates in there, which it would be really busy, so that's why I have to put it out as weeks. But it consistently, you can see that anytime there's a holiday, folks get together, congregate more, there's more risk for spreading the virus, you'll see trends in the numbers going up and down. And that's kind of what we're looking at. Even some can be related to school going back in session and the required testing based on some of the policies and protocols as well. So right now, unfortunately, we're at the highest number um, we've been at in a while for week 39. Yeah, I believe it's at uh, 250 for the latest number. So um, definitely not trending in the direction we want to. But at the same time, we were prepared for this because we knew that Thanksgiving holiday, we were going to have an increase in numbers. I mentioned percent positive. That is the green line. Again, that comes from the state once a week. So this next slide is the demographic data specific to Stanley County. The uh, demographic information is listed on the left hand side. The deaths associated with that is the pink column and shows the number. Um, and obviously 75 and older individuals that have most, uh, most health issues, obviously that, that's the population that is most susceptible to COVID-19. Female, male, you can see the mix there in numbers 45 and 33. Uh, majority from a race makeup is 60 white, uh, 11 African American, two other and unknown. And then it shows, goes on to show the Hispanic ethnicity. Congregate living setting of the 78, 49 were directly related to the long-term care or correctional facility. On the right-hand column, it shows the total number. Um, and you can see our 25 to 49 age group is most, uh, most acceptable to contracting COVID. And that's pretty representative, most out and about, most active, makes sense. Um, gender is pretty kind of even there. Um, based on our population, the makeup, obviously 20,000, 2,071 rather, excuse me, is uh, number of total white and then African Americans 428. Any specific questions about that? I know that's a lot of information on this particular slide. Yes, sir. I do. I, I look at the information. Um, it's interesting that the 25 to 40, 25 to 49s are the highest percentage of positive but the less deaths. And I would just hope they don't get into a false sense of security that they'll survive it because they're also spreading it. So I, I, I get frustrated sometimes when people say, well, it's not that bad because I just had a little fever or something like that. But what you don't know is how did the person that you spread it to, how did they do with their health? Does that make sense? So, you know, they could be the ones spreading it to a 50 to 60 to 65 year old. So. And, oh, and just hope that people don't get a false sense of security because they're 25 to 49 and they'll be able to conquer it and just go out and about and not take safety precautions in place. Yes, sir. And Commissioner, that kind of falls in line with a lot of what we see with family gatherings around the holidays. I mean, everybody wants to be together. You have the younger, younger folks in the family getting together with a lot of the, the elderly in the family and, then, you know, people become positive, people more susceptible and it's very concerning. So that's, again, why we even, even though we know the family members well, there's still a uh, potential there of spreading this, this disease. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. This is uh, kind of uh, one way we can share information uh, among counties, our surrounding counties. Uh, we list all our counties there, Anson, Cabarrus, Montgomery, Rowan, and Union. And we uh, provided a total of the cases of PCR and antigen. That's a polyamorous chain reaction, which is our standard test that's most, uh, most accurate. And then you have your antigen, which is your rapid test that's also available. So that kind of goes, shows you the, the uh, total test for that. And then you can look at the county population as well. 
The nice thing about this, the way we're presenting this information here is there's a rate for some of this information that can kind of see where you fall. So if you look at the percent positive, which is a seven day roll on average, we see we're currently at nine. That's a, that's a good thing. We're lower than our neighbors, which means more people were testing that are negative. So in some of these other counties, the numbers are higher, which means with all the tests given, there's more positives. That's why the rate would be higher there. Uh, if you look at cases per 100,000 for the last seven days, we're currently at 390. Again, I want to point out that it's as of Sunday on this uh, information as well, which I know can get a little confusing. So that kind of shows uh, cases per 100,000 for the last seven days. That's also a rate, number of cases divided by population times 100,000. That's how we would retain that rate and see how we compare to other, other counties, surrounding counties. I mentioned population. Um, again, that came from the Office of State Budget, Budget and Management. Then our daily cases are seven day roll on average per 100,000. That's also a rate as well. You take your seven day average new daily cases and divide that by the population divided by 100,000. That's how we're able to make that determination. Um, our number went up significantly. We were at 38, and then with the most written as of Friday, and now we went up to 50.7. And I can tell you that's because we had several cases that came in over the weekend which really impacted that number and changed that rate for us. Moving on to the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about the vaccination. I consider it the light at the end of the tunnel. I think a lot of us have been um, looking forward to this. I and mean, it's not gonna be a be all end all. We're certainly not in the clear with COVID-19, but it has been announced from Department of Health and Human Services that Pfizer doses will be available 12-14 and the Moderna doses will be available 1221. And these will be allocated obviously based on population capacity to manage. So um, Mecklenburg, Charlotte Mecklenburg Hospital Authority, which is part of Atrium, or maybe Atrium for, for what I know, is uh, it was one of the delivery sites because they have the potential to store some of these vaccines at that sub temperatures of negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, um, I mean, excuse me, Celsius that, that's required but then once um, it's determined by the state how that will be distributed, we'll get a better idea of what that means to Stanley County. So that's certainly something we'll be following closely and communicating with the state with um, on a regular basis. Fortunately for the health department, 100% uh, of skilled nursing facilities and 75% of adult congregate homes have registered with pharmacy partnerships. So CVS and Walgreens will administer these vaccines for these sites, which would be a, a uh, huge burden off the, your local health department and some of the hospitals as well that may would potentially be involved with that. Uh, we've determined about 2,670 total health care workers in Stanley County. First responders, we're looking at about 682. These will be considered a priority to receive the initial doses of COVID-19. And just for your awareness, the state vaccination plan is on the website, on the DHHS website, if you want to know a little bit more. It's 148 pages long, I'll just give you a heads up. It's a long read, but there's a lot of good information there about prioritization and how this is supposed to be uh, implemented uh, statewide. And finally, uh, we're drawing up our plans locally. We have our drive through plans in place. It's probably gonna mimic our, our flu plan as well. Um, uh, we're meeting with, actually meeting with Atrium Health and uh, Brian Simpson Emergency Management tomorrow to review our plan and look at how we have, may potentially open up alternative sites for population vaccination in 2021. So on top of testing, we will certainly be conducting the vaccination as well. So there'll be, there's some challenges ahead, but uh, I think we're well prepared. We've got some staff that have been um, very dedicated, hardworking and learned really quickly on the job on, on managing this, this, this uh, disease, this pandemic. And finally, um, as a routine reminder, um, we ask everyone to wear a cloth mask, wait six feet apart, and please continue to wash your hands um, as we uh, continue to work through this COVID-19 pandemic together and, and uh, manage this uh, as a county. Thank you for your time. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. Any questions? Or comments for that matter. I got, I got a, a couple here about hospitalizations, just to clarify for the public. Um, can you explain the hospitalizations are local and the people who are, the hospitalizations are, how they're counted? Like in other words, even if they're from in Charlotte in the hospital, but they live here, they're counted 
That's correct. Yes, sir. Numbers. And what the, what the procedure is, if you know from people here that get COVID, what happens what, what's the, if they have to go to the hospital? Typically, uh, we do have some uh, folks that are that come down with COVID that stay here locally. We have um, certain so many beds, and I, I won't get into that unless you really want the number of beds available locally. But a lot of times, if they need to be intubated or they're going to be in long-term care for COVID-19, they would go to either Cabarrus or Mecklenburg County. So if it's maybe one or two two nights stay, we can house them here locally. And I'm able to pull that number up for you quickly. And this is good information. So Atrium has uh, 57 licensed beds, 10 are ICU beds, and 47 are general med surge beds. But they can uh, increase their capacity if needed. Cur uh, yes, sir. That was uh, 57 licensed beds, 10 are IC beds, and 47 are general med surge beds. And they do have capacity increases needed. And at this point in time, they're managing well. I mean, as far as I know, they have the capacity, which is a good thing because we don't know what the numbers increasing as they are. We'll continue to monitor that. Did I answer your question, Commissioner? Yes, I have a, another one about the hospitalization. Do you have another average hospital stay for someone on COVID and about the cost would be if there's a difference between cost with somebody who has insurance and somebody who does not have insurance? I do have some basic information. It obviously the, the length of stay would be dependent upon if they need to be intubated or if they're in ICU. But let's say there's a total, let's say that there's a six day stay on, on average, um, which a lot of times that's for inpatient care, you'll find that. Uh, the total estimated per patient is about $73,300 for treatment for COVID. Um, you know, there is a certain amount allowed for, you know, your Medicare versus your Medicaid. But that's what a lot of that federal dollars is set aside for to help cover those costs through the, uh, through the uh, COVID funding. So let's say Medicare reimbursement amount would be about 10,000. Estimated Medicaid reimbursement amount is about 7,500. So a lot of some of those costs are reimbursed, but a lot of those again are picked up through the COVID funding from the federal government. And then I just have two more quick questions that you'd answer them together one after the other. Because people, you, you read things and people say stuff. So basically, you maybe explain to us why there are different, why the guidelines are different for restaurants, gyms, churches, bars, than they are for retail establishments and other things. And then the last question I would have is, what can we as county commissioners do to help? Oh, that's a good question. Um, to your first question, you know, the guidelines are based on risk uh, level, risk exposure. Um, you know, a retail environment is usually less risk. You know, people are out doing their business, shopping, hopefully not staying stationary. You know, there's going to be a little bit of meet and greet going on, which is a little bit different in settings such as restaurants and gyms and, and some of the churches and bars. Obviously, people congregate more together. It just it, it's kind of part of what folks do, especially, you know, um, that's what we're accustomed to. You know, that's, that's what we enjoy as family and friends. So there's guidelines, again, are based more on risk of exposure level. So that's why you'll see some dis differences there. Um, and it, it really impacts the, the, the guidance on that. That's the mindset behind that that comes down um, from the federal and the state level. Um, the other question was, uh, as county commissioner, just con continue to support your local health department and stay informed. And we ask you just um, encourage folks to, uh, you know, wash, wear, wait, and wash. Wear your mask, uh, wait your time, turn so you can six foot apart and um, wash hands. That's the biggest thing. We, we continue to get that message out from the very beginning. So appreciate the question. Any other questions, Mr. Jenkins? Okay, there. <clears throat> Again, kind of like what Commissioner Oshido said, this is more for the general public's knowledge, but I think when we sit back and watch what these guys are doing, and when I say these guys, I mean our, our, our public health officials here, the director and his team, and our hospital workers and our, our, our staff at the county level that have been battling this, we assume they have some kind of guidebook that, that they're flipping open going, pandemic chapter one, what I'm supposed to do. They didn't. When they developed our COVID-19 drive through program, there was no book. They just figured it out. They, there is some guidance. That guidance did get developed as everybody else figured it out. But they didn't wait. They, they took it upon themselves. Now they're forced 
to, and they aren't complaining about it. I'm just, I'm just letting folks to understand what they deal with. Now they have to figure out while dealing with a pandemic and managing to ramp up drive through COVID testing services. Hey, by the way, with the same people, the same staff, the same resources and no additional hours in the day, they've invented and developed a COVID vaccine drive through program. They do all this stuff. They collaborate. They figure out solutions on their own before they get guidance because there is no guidance coming. And we're just told you have to do it and they do it. So a huge thank you to our our staff at the county. They don't hear it enough, but I just kind of hear from my role on here and in the Board of Health sometimes what they do that no one knows about. And it's pretty awesome if you see how they managed to do it successfully, knowing that there's no book for them to flip through. Um, thank you guys and all your staff for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Law, uh, Chairman Lawhon, excuse me, sir. I have one more PSA, public service announcement, if I may, and I'll I'll, I'll leave you guys at. Um, just wanted to make mention that uh, Stanley County Health Department's continued to test Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 1. Appointment is required. That's right here at the health department. It is drive-through. We bill insurance, but no out-of-pocket cost is, is incurred upon the, uh, the patient. And Optum serve at the Crutchfield campus over in Locust is Monday, Friday, Saturday from 10 to 2, and Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday from 3 to 7. Appointment is required, um, and it can be done online. So I just want to share that piece of information. Jenkins, I do have two questions. Oh, yes, sir. Um, our testing, <clears throat> or when you request a test, do you still have to have some issues that might indicate you may be COVID? No, sir. Anybody can be tested at this time. Okay, so you don't have to have any kind of issue. Yeah, and typically two to three days we get your results back in most okay. instances. Uh, the second question, I know that the Pfizer vaccines have to be stored at super cold conditions, 90-some, yes. minus 90-some degrees. <laughs> when those vaccines are taken out to administer to a person, how long, I mean, you can't shoot somebody in the arm with a minus 92 degrees, you might make their arm fall off. Mm -hmm. What kind of, uh, I mean, do, you, do we have any idea how long that vaccine's gonna last after it comes out at cold, cold temperature? That's a great question. There is an acclimation process. I don't have that in front of me, but there is a guide that goes along with that particular um, drug from Pfizer or vaccine from Pfizer, I could, I'll be happy to share that with you if you're interested and give you a little bit more information on that. We're still kind of digesting some of that information as well. So yeah, that, that, that would be good. It is and, concerning. Yeah, yes, that would be very good. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, and any other questions, Mr. Jenkins? Mr. Jenkins, could you email us those those times and those locations? Be happy to. Yes, sir. Thank you. I do have one if I could. <clears throat> and you may have clear need to clarify I heard you say that you will bill their insurance but if they don't have insurance what it's covered through the COVID federal federal dollars are covered so if they don't have insurance uninsured they cannot be, be denied a test and they'll probably that's going to be the same thing for vaccination as well if they don't have insurance it'll be covered through federal dollars and what is the cost be? I'd probably be I've heard for the vaccine Commissioner Furr, I've heard around 100 bucks, but don't hold me to that because I don't know if they've actually made that determination yet. We don't, we haven't been made aware. That's just some, I guess that would be speculation. So, um, but once we get that information, um, we'd be happy to share that as well. Yeah. I know a COVID test right now runs in, uh, around 100, 120 bucks and we bill and again if you don't have insurance or you're underinsured we you, you still cannot be denied a, a test so any other questions very good presentation we appreciate it and thank you gentlemen you can kind of keep us updated as we need thank you yes, sir okay <clears throat> Item number three, Ken Swearingen, Airport Director. Ordinance request for the airport minimum standards, rules, and regulations. 
Mr. Chairman, Board of Commissioners, the Airport Authority appreciates your consideration this evening for the approval of the revised Stanley County Airport Minimum Standards and Rules and Regulations as Stanley County Public Ordinances. The two documents are highly recommended by the FAA and the NC NCDOT Division of Aviation for general aviation airports to ensure the operational integrity of su such airports in providing aeronautical services in a safe, reasonable, fair manner without unjust discrimination to the public. Having these documents in good standing also play a major role in the grant assurances that are required and monitored for the airport's participation in federal and state grants. The authority has gone through a lengthy process of revising the existing documents that have been in place for a number of years but were never approved as county ordinances, which is actually vital to the enforcement of the documents. During the revision process, documents from many other airports were evaluated to capture the best practices and tailor these documents to our airport. The authority has had ample time to review and make changes. Then as a final step, the documents were reviewed for comments and or, cha and or changes by Mr. Keith Merritt, a well-known attorney that specializes in aviation matters. His recommendations were reviewed, evaluated, and incorporated as approved by the authority in the documents being presented. As we look toward our vision of the future for the airport with major enhancements coming for the North Carolina Air National Guard, the construction and operation of the North Carolina Emergency Training Center, local and regional business development, it is time to put these documents forward as county ordinances so that, they, that, so that we have a solid set of operational parameters for the airport's growth into the future. The documents were in your meeting packet and available for your review. Are there any questions regarding these documents? Any questions for Mr. Swearing? I've got one, Mr. Chairman, and it's more of a, just an overview. If I understand it correctly, these are the rules you already have in place. These are your rules. They aren't new rules. You're just at, asking us to put them in the form of an ordinance so they have some teeth and they actually True. can be enforced. Yes, we're revi we have revised what we had, bringing in some new requirements from the FAA and Department of Transportation. But yes, they are. And putting some way to enforce them in place. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Swearingen? Don't see any. I will tell you that we've all had this book to read the ordinances. Hopefully over the weekend, I had a couple good naps reading, <laughs> reading this information, but I agree with you, this needs to be approved. Uh, no other questions. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? I make a motion that we approve these. Commissioner Asciutto made a motion. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Allman, any other comments? All in favor of the approval, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, Bailey Emmerich, Planning and Zoning, to come forward. We have, I think, three uh, zoning issues that she's going to share with us. Yes, sir. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to remove my mask for just a minute so I can present. Um, all right, let's see. All right, thank you all for having me tonight. Um, the first thing I'm gonna present to you really quickly um, is ZA 20-07. This was previously two tracts of land which were 4.19 acres and 0.43 acres. Since then, they have been recombined um, to one track which equals out to 4.62 acres. Jeffrey Alston requested the rezoning of this track located at 34004 Kingsley Drive from M2, which is heavy manufacturing, to RA, which is residential agricultural. Um, the properties that are adjacent to it are all industrial properties. This parcel is adja adjacent to City Lake and parcels in the Albemarle city limits. Um, these parcels are also zoned for heavy and light industrial uses. Residential uses and the county are a residential agricultural zoning district. 
although it has been zoned M2 for many years, um, and we think it has been zoned M2 since before zoning in 1973. This parcel has been used for residential purposes and has never been used for manufacturing. Several manufacturing facilities are nearby, but none are located on City Lake. This parcel is located in a growth area per the 2010 Stanley County Land Use Plan. Um, traffic data from 2015 for nearby City Lake Drive averages 300 vehicles per day. Um, here you can see the parcel. Um, it's a larger track of land. Um, even though this is located in a growth area and has some industrial development nearby, it is unlikely to see substantial manufacturing development in this vicinity. All uses along City Lake Drive are residential and it would likely be advantageous to provide a residential buffer to City Lake. This track is visible from City Lake and City Lake Park to preserve the view shed and to promote continued use of this parcel for residential purpose. The planning staff does recommend approval of this request. Um, this is just a more zoomed out that you can see City Lake. Um, and I'm gonna skip to the next one so you can see all the industrial uh, zone districts that follow around that. Um, a large portion of them are zoned for Albemarle. Um, I did notify all of the adjacent property owners within 100 feet and I did not receive a phone call with any complaints um, about the request. I did sit, receive one phone call just for information purposes, but nobody has um, had an issue with it. And I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Any questions? Don't oh, hear any. Okay. This does require a legislative or public hearing. So at this time, I'll open the public hearing and ask if there's anyone here to speak for this rezoning request. Yes, sir. Please come forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Board. Uh, I'm Jeff Austin. I'm actually the owner of the property and uh, just wanted to know if there was any questions. It's been in the family for years. My understanding, it was part of an overlay uh, with EDC or for the heavy industrial years ago. Uh, the contiguous properties around it are primarily all residential, even though they may still be zoned. I was surprised to learn that it was zoned heavy manufacturing. So uh, there's a residence there, has been there since 1950. Uh, and again, part of the parcel of land has been farmed. So just asking for a rezoning. Uh, uh, it's gonna make a great piece of property for somebody to develop down the road. It's uh, water frontage, 800 feet of road frontage. There is city water there now, uh, uh, easily for a voluntary annexation or annexation. Questions by the board? Any questions? Mr. Chairman, I do have one. Okay, Commissioner Farr. Are you planning on developing it, or are you just going to sell it to be developed? What What are your plans? Uh, currently, Century 21, Russ Hollins is representing the property for me, has been since March. Uh, I have no intentions of redeveloping it, but we have had uh, prospective clients to look at the property, and especially the ones that were from out of town, they were a little bit spooked with the zoning. Uh, when somebody looked at it, uh, I think that was a hurdle that I wanted to go ahead and, and check that off the box. So I, I think initially or eventually it will be redeveloped. Any other questions? Thank you for your Thank comments. You. Anyone else here to speak for? Seeing none, is there anyone here to speak against this zoning, rezoning? Good evening, Chairman, members of the board. Um, Candace Lauder, Director of the Stanley County Economic Development Commission. Um, my comments about this rezoning request are not in support or opposition, uh, only to provide you additional information about the parcel under consideration. Uh, as Ms. Emmert stated, the site is in close proximity to several other existing industries. These include quality enclosures, gentry mills, global packaging solutions, Southern Mechanical, and the SEBA building which has recently been renovated for warehousing space and they do have two tenants. While the parcel under consideration is not currently served by sewer, it meets many of the other criteria for industrial projects, 
has manufacturing zoning, it's good highway access, it's relatively flat for this area, which is hard to come by in Stanley County, and has water provided by the city of Albemarle. When our office receives criteria for manufacturing prospects, speed to market, market is frequently a decision driver. So maintaining an industrial designation will aid in the scoring of this site for possible projects. Our office has had one industrial prospect in the last month express interest in the site, and while it's unlikely that this uh, project will move forward at this location, it confirmed for us that this could be a viable location for another industry. Uh, one of the recommendations in the 2010 land use plan states that Stanley County needs to continue to provide a healthy supply of land for commercial and industrial development. Presently, which was in 2010, the county is experiencing residential growth. However, commercial and industrial development is needed to ensure that the tax burden to pay for necessary infrastructure to support the residential growth is not placed completely on the residential taxpayers. So 10 years later, our county maintains a very low inventory of sites and buildings that can compete for industrial projects. Further reducing the number of sites from our list of properties that could compete for projects does not support the land use plan recommendation of maintaining and improving our product inventory. Lastly, if the rezoning is approved and an industrial prospect is interested in the site for the future, Rezoning the parcel back to manufacturing could be a lengthy and difficult process. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone here to speak against? Seeing no one, I will say that this legislative hearing is closed. And tell the board in your package, I believe, I'm sure you've read this, that the planning board recommended approval by a 6 to 0 vote from their board. Uh, you've heard uh, Mr. Austin speak, and uh, what's the pleasure of the board on this rezoning request? I'd like to make a motion that we approve it. Rezoning request. Yeah, Commissioner Shudo requests that it be approved to be going from heavy manufacturing to uh, residential agriculture. Is there a second? Second. Second uh, by Commissioner Barbie. Any other discussion about this? Let's vote. All in favor of changing from M2 to RA, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 7 0. Ms. Emmerich, you're up again. Thank you, Mr. Law Han. Um, the second thing I have before you, let me get to it really quickly. Um, this is ZA 20-08. Um, Matthew Hudson requests the rezoning of a 64.1 acre track located on South Business US 52 Highway. Um, this is actually the opposite of the last one. It's currently zoned RA and he's wanting to rezone it to light manufacturing, which is M1. Um, the parcel to the south is already zoned M1, but is used for agricultural purposes. The parcel has no structures and is currently used for agriculture. According to, Ms. to Matthew Hudson, a 250,000 square foot distribution facility is proposed for this parcel by his company. The western boundaries of the parcel border new US 52 and the Winston-Salem southbound railroad. The eastern edge of the property near South Business 52, as well as properties to the east and north, are located in growth areas as designated by the 2010 Stanley County Land Use Plan. The Planning Board considered this request at the November 10, 2020 meeting. Several neighbors were present, but none were in opposition. There were some preferences from neighbors that encouraged Mr. Hudson to have the entrance off of new US 52, if possible, and to restrict outdoor lighting. Mr. Hudson indicated that an entrance off the new US 52 was preferable to the company as well. He stated that outing, outside lighting would mostly be with security lights attached to the building. 
Traffic data from two, from 2018 for South Business 52 is 2,600 vehicles per day. For the newer section of the US 52 on the western edge of the property, the traffic data indicates approximately 5,800 vehicles a day. Primary access to the property is currently on South Business 52. A 10-foot vegetative buffer would be required per the zoning ordinance. The planning board voted six to zero to recommend approval of this rezoning request because this parcel is adjacent to property already zoned M1, has rail access, and is de its development would be economically beneficial to the county. And I'll show you the parcel here. This is just an aerial view um, of the parcel. And this is um, a zoned view. You can see the other parcel that's zoned County M1 um, also as well. And I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Any questions? No questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation. This also requires a legislative or public hearing, so I'll declare public hearing is open. Anyone here to speak for this rezoning request? Don't see anyone, anyone here to speak against this rezoning request? Don't see one, uh, so I declare the public hearing closed. If uh, commissioners uh, would turn in their book, over to the very last page of this particular request. There's certain languages that we're supposed to use. So what's the pleasure of the board with this <clears throat> rezoning request? Mr. Chairman, I move that the request by Matthew Hudson to rezone the parcel located on business US 52 Highway South from RE Residential Agricultural to M1 Light Manufacturing be approved. This parcel is in the growth area and adjacent to a parcel already zoned M1 and its development will be an economic benefit to our county. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Commissioner Barbie, thank you. Any discussion? Yeah, other discussion? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> All in favor of rezoning from RA to M1 on this parcel Please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion rezoning carries 7 0. Ms. Emmerich? Okay. Thank y'all again. This is the last time, I promise. Um, the third thing I have before you tonight um, Berkeley Group has requested the addition of a telecommunications tower be assigned to a 10,000 square foot portion of a parcel that's currently located at 40477 Snugs Road in Norwood for construction of a 195 foot monopole cell tower. The property is currently zoned RA, um, residential agricultural. The primary use on the property has been a single wide manufactured home. The proposed monopole is to the north side of the mobile home and will be over 300 foot away. And I'll go ahead and skip to that um, just so you can kind of see where it's at and where it will be. This is the parcel and you can see the manufactured home at the very front of the property. Berkeley Group has submitted all required paperwork indicating the location, fall zone, setbacks, and proposed buffer. All tower overlay district requirements have been met or exceeded for this proposed cell tower location, with the exception of the required vegetative buffer. While a partial vegetative buffer may be required, the full requirement may be waived as recommended by the planning board due to the forested location. The planning board considered this request at their meeting on November 10th, 2020. There was no opposition expressed to the construction of this tower by neighbors. The owner of the parcel, Roy Lee Morton Jr., is supporting this request. The planning board considered the map of the service coverage area and the need for additional service in the area. Bonnie Newell represented Berkeley Group, answering the questions that the board had considered and, need, and considered the needs that, and that Verizon and other companies prefer to co-located when feasible as required by the zoning ordinance. No suitable co-location tower is in this vicinity. The tower will not generate significant additional traffic on Snugs Road, but will provide cell tower communication service in a traditionally dead zone. This parcel is bordered on the northwest by Porter Baptist Church, 
the planning board unanimously recommended approval of applying the telecommunications tower overlay district to this parcel as requested in order to improve phone and data service in this area. And I'm going to go ahead and this is um, the map that they submitted to us. Um, and you can see on there where the home is located on the property and then how far it will be away from that. I did also notify um, the adjoining property owners within 100 feet of this parcel as well um, and I received no phone calls, emails, um, or anything of that sort. This is the existing coverage um, that currently remains there and as I go to the next slide you'll be able to see what's going to happen if the tower were to be approved. So it would go from that to that, um, which is a substantial change. Um, and that is it. And I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Any questions? I'm just curious, is this the same group that uh, proposed the one in Aquadel a few months back? No, sir, this is a different group. Anyone else? I, yes. I move that the request. I move that the request by Bertha Group to apply the telecommunications overlay district to a portion of the parcel located at 40477 Snug Road, Norwood, be approved. Oh, I forgot. Anyone here to speak for? Would you please state your name. Good evening. Good evening. Bonnie Newell, and on behalf of Berkeley Group, Verizon, and the Mortons, I thank you for your time. I'll be brief. I could talk for hours about it, but Bailey did a fabulous job. We won't allow you to talk hours. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. But I am here to answer any questions. Um, we do ask for your support of this uh, request, and, and um, again, I think it was pretty self-explanatory. It meets all of the rules and regulations. And we've been doing this for about 25 years since the beginning of these phones. And we, we believe this is a great site. So thank you. Any questions? I, you, I have one since you happen to be standing here. Sure. It's, it's not often to get someone like you in the same room to ask this question to. So is it about 5G? Uh, no. Oh, OK. Uh, no, no, sure. no. I work in the IT field. No, I know better. OK. Um, what is the expected? Uh, it's 195 foot monopole. What's the expected coverage area Propagation. from that tower? Yeah, it, five miles, ten miles? No, no, about a mile and three quarters to two and a quarter. Okay, uh, it's very small. And as people soak, suck in that data, it gets smaller, which is what you're finding. So, but thank you for the question. Anyone else here to speak for? Seeing none, anyone here to speak against? Seeing none, I declare the public hearing closed. <laughs> What's well, a pleasure to board? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Eford down here on this end. Uh, I move that the request by Berkeley Group be applied to the telecommunication communication overlay district to a portion of the parcel located at 40477 Snugs Road in Norwood be approved. The underlying use of this parcel will remain as an additional of improvement cell coverage and will benefit the residents and those traveling in this area. Commissioner Eford made the motion, seconded by Commissioner Barbie. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it, seven to zero. Thank you. Next order of business is a rate modification request. Presenter is our finance director, Toby Henson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you this evening is a resolution uh, to proceed with a rate modification with uh, Truist Bank, which is formerly uh, BB&T. 
you you actually uh, the board approved this rate modification back uh, on November 2nd but uh, Truist Bank requires before they proceed with doing it to uh, for the board to approve an official or approve or, or adopt an official resolution to proceed with this uh, rate reduction or rate modification and just as a little bit of background behind it uh, this loan was actually uh, done in uh, 2008 uh, for 13 million dollars for uh, Locust and uh, Aquadale Elementary School uh, renovations and since then in the rate at that time was 4.48 percent since then we've done two uh, rate reductions or modifications with the first one getting the rate down to 3.67 percent and then the second one which was done in 2017 got it down to 2.69 percent and this modification here will uh, bring the rate down to 1.54 percent um, I'll be glad to answer any questions that uh, that you may have any questions of Mr. Hanson? I believe so. Thank you, Toby. All right. Thank you. Okay, we're getting our interest rate reduced. Saving some money for the taxpayers. What's the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, make a motion to approve the resolution to proceed with rate modification. Thank you, Commissioner Rahman. And a second from Vice Chairman Jordan. Any other comments, questions before we vote? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it, 7 0. Item number eight is a debt consolidation and refinance resolution. Presenter is County Manager Andy Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Again, this is related to uh, action you took on November 2nd um, with the rate modification. We also um, board directed staff to engage in debt consolidation and refinancing. Um, we've engaged uh, Parker Poe as special counsel to assist with that um, debt consolidation and refinancing uh, of $8.2 um, in, in, in an effort to save taxpayer dollars. Uh, and based on the advice and consent of Parker Poe's legal counsel, the attached resolution authorizing the debt consolidation and financing requires board approval. Um, and then the board will hold a public hearing at its regular meeting on January 4th. 2021 to comply with the requirements of LGC for the proposed debt consolidation and financing and that and if the board takes action on this resolution this evening uh, favorable action then um, the clerk will um, issue the notice to the paper for that public hearing on January 4th 2021 I'd be happy to answer any questions the resolution is in the packet for your um, consideration any questions of uh, manager Lucas Thank you, Andy. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure everybody's had time to review this uh, resolution. And uh, what's your pleasure? Mr. Chairman, make a motion to approve the attached resolution. I got a motion by Commissioner Almond. Do we have a second? Commissioner Barbie, second. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Item number nine Animal Cruelty Investigator Appointment, Vice Chairman Tommy Jordan, presenter. Um. I'm going to read a little bit of this just for the public knowledge in case anyone later has qu has questions about it. The North Carolina General Statute 19A-45 allows the Board of Commissioners to appoint an animal cruelty investigator. It is a public office. Um, 
it is it serves at the pleasure of the Board of Commissioners. It works in our case with Animal Protective Services. Um, I'll cover just some of the basic stuff. We are authorized to appoint one or more animal cruelty investigators to serve without any compensation or, or other employee benefit in this county. Um, the board may consider persons not n n nominated by any society incorporated under ANC law for the prevention of cruelty to animals. We have had the Humane Society, the Sheriff's Department, and the County Veterinarian of Record, all three, um, uh, suggest one candidate for this particular position. Um, they serve a one-year term subject to removal for for cause by our board. The, they shall, while in performance of their duties, wear in plain view a badge of design approved by the board, identifying them as animal cruelty investigators, and for some reason it says provided at no cost of the county. However, we even have the badge covered. So um, my request tonight, or my motion tonight, when the time comes, will be to appoint former Commissioner Matthew Swain to this position. Um, and to back that up for a second, um, two, two quick points. Number one, this came to my attention originally last year um, as from Director Jenkins um, when animal control was under, under control of the health department. We talked about the need for this back then. We had a lot on our plate and it just didn't come up, um, didn't get followed up on. This year it came up again and uh, he politely reminded me that well, if we'd had that position, you know, we'd had some more resources and I said, you're right and I forgot to follow up, so I'm gonna follow up now. Um, while talking to the fellow commissioners about this position, Commissioner Swain, when he was still a commissioner, said, well, when I resign from the board, I would be interested in that volunteer position. I understand it's not paid, but I would do it. And I said, can you, can you give me your CV a little bit about why you'd be a good person to do it? Um, Mr. Swain has a Bachelor of, I'm sorry, Mr. Swain has a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Science. He has a Bachelor of Science in Poultry Science. Um, his concentrations included the nutrition of, of domestic a animals, a focus on beef and dairy cattle, equine, swine, and poultry. He did uh, undergraduate research on special problems in animal science, specifically regarding an anatomy and physiology of, of domestic animals, body scoring, which is something that's very, very handy and very hard to necessarily do with large animals if you don't know what you're doing. Um, he was a lab instructor for that course of senior year college. He has a concentration in companion animal ma management, including training in animal w welfare. Um, he has a master's of science degree in agriculture and extension from 2009. Um, quite frankly, he is the, probably the most qualified person I've ever met in this county to do this, uh, with the exception of a potential board certified veterinarian, um, which we don't have any of those jumping up and down to do this job for free. Um, um, he taught agriculture education courses for, uh, in animal science for nine years. And considering Stanley County's rural makeup and significant amount of large animal welfare issues that arise, aside from a board certified vet, I literally cannot think of a better candidate qualified to serve. So before I make my motion, I guess it would be appropriate if possible to ask if there's any questions or comments. Any questions? I have a question I'd like to have kind of a little point of interest here that uh, this would in no way ever become a paid position or compensation of any type, even in the future. That is correct. It is specifically prohibited by North Carolina Statute 19A45 from receiving any kind of compensation. In fact, they even outlined that the county cannot pay for his badge. Yeah. That's good. I just want to make that clear. Thank you. I have a question. Has this been advertised or have we been searched for volunteers or anything else? No, sir, about or open it up for anything like we do with other boards? No, because does he have a resume that he submitted? Like I think other people have to fill out paperwork. This isn't a board, so we're not. It's just an appointed position in the county. Um, we can accept more than one. Working with the people that we are working with, um, knowing that they have to work with the sheriff's department. Commissioner, uh, previous Commissioner Swain has an experience working with them. He's got experience working with law enforcement and in this role, uh, or, or he has the education for this role. So the, the, my drive here was to get someone to do this the first time, at least for the first year, that can help the sheriff's office come up with a protocol, job description, duties, iron out anything um, that would be necessary. So in such time as if the, the sheriff's office asked for another one, or we chose to 
want to create another one or point another one, that we'd have a little more well-defined uh, job description and uh, understanding of how the job was done. But no, we, uh, I personally specifically did not want to turn around and advertise the, this out to the general public because every single cat and dog lover in the entire county will nominate themselves as the best person to do this job. And uh, we would get inundated with result, uh, a request. County Manager Lucas. Yes. And just for your, um, just for board information, this typically isn't an, an animal cruelty investigator that does really works with cats and dogs. This is primarily for your large animals, um, livestock, uh, horses, um, and cattle usually isn't one either because obviously they're, they're it's money sitting out there in the field. So, um, you know, to be honest with you, probably the probably the most common. Um, call that will come in will be for for horses um, that's just been my experience and there's been a couple cases in the 12 years I've been here where we've had um, calls about um, you know horses that were were um, allegedly um, being um, starved so um, but this isn't necessarily not to say that they wouldn't do dogs and cats but that, this isn't we have plenty of folks in the county veterinarians others that can can assist with the dogs and cat piece of it in terms of cruelty um, this is really more for livestock that is correct the person can do the, the, the investigator does have the authority to work with dogs and cats but unless animal uh, animal protective services happen to be overtaxed or needed some, some extra investigative legwork i cannot see that necessarily being the focus of the job. The job is going to be primarily large animal, livestock, goats, pigs, horses. Any other questions? Well, I would just like to throw this out there. I mean, this is my first meeting back and looking at this, understand the need to it, and all of a sudden have a nominee on here. And I would hope we could maybe table this for a month. So give us a chance to digest it and see who else is out there because honestly the optics don't really look good. You know, when you throw it out there and you put a former county commissioner on right away, that's just, that's just me without opening up to the public or even having us look for anyone else to do it. I would like to, and Matthew's a great guy and I'm sure I would support him on this. But I would like to at least wait a month and look at, that's, that's just me and perhaps see if there's any other interest out there for any other person. I don't know if I make a motion to table it at this point or or does he have to? I, don't know if I believe Tommy made a motion. Made a motion, okay, so. Uh, commit, uh, Vice Chairman Jordan made a motion that we appoint Matthew Swain to this particular job which does require a second. So at this time, I'm gonna ask, is there a second for this motion? I'll second. Okay, Commissioner Reford second the motion to appoint Matthew Swain to the animal cruelty investigator slot for one year. Any other discussion? Is this where I could ask if we could make the table? You could uh, add. For this or does, would he have to table it? He would have to withdraw for, his motion. For a month? We've worked with the Sheriff's Department, the Board of Health, the Health Director, the County Veterinarian, the old and new animal control officers, and uh, Bessie Swain on this one. I, I, we have the, the full support of all parties with this candidate. I, I really would not wait to go back and start again from scratch. Ready to vote on the motion that's on the floor. All in favor of appointing Matthew Swain as an animal cruelty investigator for a one year term, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carries six to one. Commissioner Jordan, when, when does that appoint start? Is it January 1 or is it? No. Back to it, the um, it could technically be at the discretion of the sheriff. I, I had intended in my notes to say uh, uh, December 8th. I didn't do that, um, but I, was, I would assume at the discretion of the sheriff. Uh, next agenda item is the 2021 NCACC Legislative Goal Conference. 
and we need designations of voting delegates and our county manager Andy Lucas is going to make the presentation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you, you've got the information before you. Um, I guess the pro and con of, of this is the you, you don't have to travel to Raleigh, but you also have to participate virtually. So <laughs> pick your poison. Um, but this is a uh, two day conference. It's not full two days, but uh, January 14th, Friday, January 15th. Um, they're seeking a voting delegate and alternate delegate uh, if there was, you know, if one of the voting delegate was, was to get sick or something came up that the commissioners already had another person in place to take that individual's place at the virtual conference for the county association's legislative agenda. Do we know the times on uh, 14th and 15th? I'm looking here, I don't see it. We don't have that information. Typically, they'll start in the um, morning on the on the uh, on that Thursday. But we can get those that we can get that information for you. But typically, they'll start in the morning on that Thursday and go to mid afternoon, and then they'll pick it back up on the morning of that, that Friday and go to like when I say mid afternoon, probably like two or three on the on that Thursday, and then you'd be done by lunchtime on that Friday. Do we have a volunteer to do this? <laughs> Hear water. That's all I hear. <laughs> Let me ask you this, can Commissioner Shuto. Okay. Let me ask you this also, because I may come and join you for part of it. Uh, I'll be the alternate. Okay. Uh, if I if I were to come up here, I would want to come to the county office. Yeah, we can absolutely you set you cameras up. Cameras mm -hmm. and all that. Yep. Uh, well, we could set you up in the manager's conference room and have you have you do it in there where you could look at the big screen and Peter might want to do it at his office. No, you want to do it here? If I do it at McIntosh, I ain't gonna be able to sit through that whole conference. Okay. Uh, interrupted so much. So we'll uh, Peter will be the primary. I'll be the alternate, and you'll get us the times we need to be here. We will. Thank you. And just based on my past experience with this, when with a lot of these virtual things, they are trying to make it more efficient versus people sitting there for seven eight hours a day uh, it's a little different when you don't have those opportunities to fellowship Up on zoom yeah, yeah. so I, I don't think it'll take as long as it has in the past okay. thank you uh next is the stanley community college trade facility architect and engineering contract presenter is our county manager andy lucas Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. The Architect Engineering and Construction Oversight Services contract from ADW, which was the firm that was selected um, to do the design work for the proposed new trades facility at Stanley Community College, has established a fee of $780,500. And that fee is actually, I know it sounds like a lot, but that fee is actually in line with the average of 8 to 12% of the anticipated construction cost. And based on the preliminary estimates, the facility will cost over $8 million to construct. Um, and that was you know, not too out of line with where we thought it was going to be initially in that $7.5 million range. So it's, it's come in a little higher than that in their initial estimates. That doesn't mean the bidding. You know, we still don't know where the bids will come in. This facility will likely take into June to get designed and be June before it goes out to bid. And so a lot can change between now and June in terms of construction prices. Could go up, could go down. And we may decide we need to table the whole project at some point. But um, so we won't spend this full seven seven hundred eighty thousand this year um, because part of this is construction administration, and which won't even start until the the project's actually ongoing and it's a general contractor out there working. So um, I'm recommending that we appropriate excess Article 46 sales tax revenue from prior years to cover the associated fees. Um, and like I say, it's not anticipated we'll spend the full amount in 2021 um, because the, the bidding will likely will not happen until late May, uh, early June. Um, so I'll be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Um, regarding the project uh, or the fee, or the fees, but I know that fee sounds like a money a lot of money, but when you're talking about an eight million dollar building, eight million plus, um, you know, eight to ten to twelve percent, it's going to be right around that number. Any questions for County Manager Lucas? Well, have any questions? Uh, what's the pleasure of the board on this contract?
ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Can you make your liquors? The this is the project that was design bid build. And we're shifting it to design build. It was design build, and we shifted it to design bid build because we're going after a um, one and a half to two million dollar federal economic development administration grant and you can't start work on a project until you've been awarded a grant or you eat that you can't you can't get reimbursed for that so if we did design build you've essentially let the general contractor start working um and you you're that all those costs would be ineligible um and so the design bid build and architectural is ineligible ineligible anyways um they're only going to do construction so um we elected to back up and we did a new process by which we did a RFQ for just architects instead of a general contractor. Um, and we, that, through that process, ADW was hired as the architect to design the building. And so now we're also working with Central Carolina Council of Governments on the Federal Economic Development Administration grant, and it's been submitted. We, we haven't heard yet. Um, that would help offset the cost of the facility. How much is the cost increase over the original cost? Increase? We were originally estimating, we had conversations, this would be a seven and a half million dollar building. So the initial construction estimates at this point are um, around 8.3 to 8.5 um, million dollars. So, you know, you're roughly, but we have $600,000 as a placeholder in the Stanley Community College's budget that we put in there two years ago intentionally with sales tax revenue um, from the Article 46 to be able, as a placeholder for debt service in the future, because we knew we would be designing this and at some point that we would take that 600,000 and we would put it into the debt service. They've been using it for one-time projects, beautification, um, ADA compliance, um, uh, building repairs uh, and those types of things. And so they haven't put it into their operating budget and been, you know, come used to be having that and salaries and other things. They've been using it for one time um, projects uh, for campus. So even if the project comes in at, you know, over eight million dollars and if the bid comes in at eight million, we would be fine with the money we have in the budget to pay that debt service. Andy, well, quick question. Yes, sir. If if we don't get the grant, will we just revert back to that original plan? No, we would just we would we would put it out. I mean, it would just go out to bid through the this process. We essentially instead of doing the design build, we just we we backed up and went the design bid build, and so now we're just having an architect you know doing the, the the design versus the general contractor hiring the the architect themselves. Uh, we have the authority to use design build, correct. We just, we, we initially we thought, but then when the Federal Economic Development Administration funding was put forth, it was going to get really complicated and messy trying to do design build with the EDA money. Um, and so we backed up and said, let's do it a more traditional way with the design bid build. Um, and obviously any general contractor, local general contractor who wanted to bid on it will have the opportunity through the, the bidding process. Uh, not necessarily. In fact, I, I, I think it depends on who you talk to. I think generally, you know, when you do a design bid build, you're going to get low. You're going to get the lowest bidder. You know, your lowest bidder typically is the one you got to go with. You know, when you go design build, you don't not necessarily guaranteed that's the lowest bid. I mean, that's that's your that's your preferred contractor. And typically there will be some efficiencies identified through the design build process in terms of just being quicker to getting it up and ready because it moves faster and there's opportunities for it to um for for the general contractor to find some efficiencies through that process for example our ems base came in and um i think roughly one hundred fifty thousand dollars under budget and so you know now per the contract we split that with the with the, the general contractor 50 50. um you know but uh, you're going to pay for these architect fees either way, either whether you go design, build, or, or design big. You still have to have an architect design the building so they can be they can submit the plans to um, to the uh, to inspections to be able to 
uh, and the general contractor will need the, the, the plans to be able to build a building. So it, even though you just don't see the design in the design build contract, you're contracting directly with the general contractor. General contractor then has contracts with architects, engineers, um, you know, all the subcontractors that they work with. And so you're only having one contract that contracts with the general contractor. In this case, we'll have a, we have a contract with an architect. They have contractors with all the contracts with all these engineers. And then we'll also have a contract with the general contractor. And then sometimes you get into that a little bit of, um, you know, that mesh point between general contractor, architect and county. And it, it gets a little, sometimes it can get a little messy, but you know, we've done, we've done both models here. I mean, you know, it's not like we haven't done, you know, that the more recent trend has been to, for us to do design build, but the jail was designed on a j design bid build. Tar Hill Challenge Academy, when we renovated that money, when we got the money from the state, that $3 million, that was design bid build because the uh, uh, state made us. Uh, use that because the state feels like design bid build is the the more inexpensive option because of the low bid option. So it really it it, it yeah, but I, and I would argue that they're going to get eight. The architect's going to get eight to ten percent, no matter if it was design build or design bid build. They're just you just don't see it because you you it's their contracts with the with the. Um, with the builder, with the general contractor, and so you're not seeing that money, but it's it's in there, it's in the contract. I mean, you you can see it under their professional services line on them. And Mr. Uh, Lucas, the architect, I may be wrong, but the architect has to approve all the draws of the contractor. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, the architect will review all of the the invoice requests and sign off on those to make sure that that's part of that construction administration, which is built into this 780. And so yeah, that's why I'm saying you're not going to spend all this 780 this year. Eventually you'll spend it. But part of this is for them to come out on site and do walkthroughs and make sure that they're what they're saying they're doing on each of their invoice and their draws, as you have you referenced, um, Chairman, that that is, they sign off on that and they stamp it and say, yes, this is legitimate. And in response to Mr. Barbie's comment I work in this field a lot as a sub to GCs and ECs and architects and clients and quite frankly I'd much rather have the ARC architect working for us than, 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 than going through the GC because then we have a direct we know who's butt to chew when something goes wrong um, or we know who, who to thank when everything goes right <laughs> and um, it, it it I like the idea myself um, it, I, I don't have a preference to be honest with you. I just know when we decided, when the community college decided to go get the EDA money, just it's great. I mean, we don't know if we'll get it or not, but you know, super applaud them for you know wanting to their, their board for wanting to go try to get that money. That it really would have gotten complicated to try to do the design build with going after the EDA money because of all the EDA stipulations and requirements. I mean, it's it's um, and that's why we have the Central Island Council of Governments involved in going after that application for us because we just don't have that technical expertise on our staff to be able to go after those federal pots of money. There, there's a ton of hoops to have to jump through, and then you have to monitor afterwards. Is that a standard contractor for us, or did we who picked that contractor? ADW. This, 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 the, um, you know, the, the architect you're referring to, right. ADW was picked by the community college. Um, they did, we did an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications. You, you, it's not based on a low bid for architects. You don't do a low bid. Um, it's based on qualifications. And so you do it based, you, you, you have qualifications and then you negotiate the fee with the, uh, architect. So the architects submitted RFQs, or, and then they, we, they vetted those. They interviewed, I think, three different firms, uh, and AD, ADW was selected to be the firm that they, they felt like could design this building based off of their qualifications and based on the experience they had doing similar types of buildings in other community colleges within this region. Catawba Valley Community College in Hickory is, a, is probably the, the, the one that I could point to that um, – that they did a really, really nice job with um, uh, up there um, for their, uh, and it's a trades advanced manufacturing type of facility. So that their committee of the Stanley Community College Board of Trustees select, asked us to go with ADW. And then it was voted on by the full Board of Trustees as well. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman. 
Yes, sir. I would like to make a motion to approve the proposed budget amendment and authorize staff to execute a design services contract with ADW for the Stanley Community College Trace Facility. Yeah, we got a first uh, motion. Mr. Allman, two seconds. Okay. Mr. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carries 6 1. The next item is the consent agenda. Everybody's had time to look. Okay, Commissioner Shuto makes a motion to approve the consent agenda. Do we have a second? Second. Commissioner Allman, second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? <laughs> motion carries 7 0. Public comments. We had one person, one citizen to sign up, but I think he was here on the rezoning. Uh, Mr. Jeff Austin, are you still here? He's gone. Okay, so we'll take care of that. Is there anyone here that would like to make public comments? See anyone? So at this time, uh, like to ask the board for any comments, and I'm going to start with Commissioner Shuto. Just want to say it's, it's good to be back with serving you guys, and um, I think one of the improvements since I was here last time is all the communications y'all have set up in here. I know from sitting out in the audience, it's really good with the screen. The screens have been really good, and I'm trying to remember. I don't think we had these when I was here last time. Did we have to look at the screen, or did we? We had those, but somehow this is a whole lot better and this clear and it's very, very nice, very nice. Um, COVID, that was a very good report. I'm glad, I'm glad David Jenkins came. I don't think we, we may, maybe necessarily need to have them here every meeting, but I, I would like to at least once a month have them come in monthly, especially over the winter time, as we saw some of the cases are starting to spike. And just as a reminder to the public to be diligent with their washing their hands, wearing a mask, and keeping social distancing, which was one of the best things we could do, because it's going to be about what the, just getting through the cold winter months. And then um, just one thing about the, this is something we could talk about later, the public comment section there. I'd like to consider it at some point just moving it toward the front of the meeting, because sometimes people are here to talk about a specific subject that's on the agenda, and by the time it gets to the end, that, that that may have already been talked about and discussed and voted on and stuff. But um, thank you, guys. Commissioner Eford. Mr. Chairman, um, I know Judge Bridges is gone, but I'd like to thank him for, for coming out and administering an oath to Peter and myself. And I was going to thank my wife, but she left, and I hope she didn't go far because she's got the keys. Uh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Mr. Fur, don't leave. I might need a ride home across Bear Creek. Uh, and uh, I look forward to the opportunity, opportunity to serve them with you guys again, and uh, uh, Andy and Tyler and Jenny and the staff. The, you know, I think Stanley County's got the best employees you know, in the state. Thank right you. here, this don't lie. If you look at these numbers, it don't lie. So anyway, thank you very much for that. I'd like to um, wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Uh, again, please be safe. COVID is real, and uh, we need to wash and wear and wait uh, six feet. So. Again, thank you, sir, and um, hope everyone has a, a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Commissioner Barbie. I'd like to welcome Commissioner Shudo, Commissioner Eford back over. Uh, be looking forward to working with you. Uh, like I said, I, I wish everybody a Merry Christmas. I think it's our last trip till Christmas time. So uh, Merry Christmas and look forward to working with everybody. Thank you. Commissioner Furr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just like to say Friday last, it was my pleasure to help feed all the employees of Stanley County. I was in the back doing, helping out, and I would personally like to thank 
everybody for what they do for the county. As um, Mr. Eford said, those, that book don't lie. So we've got the best people we can possibly have. Thank you. Mr. Allman. I'd just like to ditto Mr. Furr's remarks uh, and thank Andy and the staff. It was a good uh, drive through Christmas deal. Y'all did an awesome job on that. We all enjoyed being there. And second, uh, Commissioner Jordan and I, last two weeks ago, we went to Animal uh, Protective Services. Let me get my verbiage right. Uh, and Tommy uh, did a bunch of pressure washing and I did some painting and they painted it Comet Blue in there and I felt like I was back at North Stanley. So it was a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks again to Lowe's who donated all the materials to make that happen. And they didn't charge the county a dime, didn't charge the sheriff's department a dime. Um, welcome, uh, Scott and Peter both. I know you've both been here b before, but it's the first time that I get to serve with you. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's going to be a good couple years. Um, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. I want to encourage everyone to be safe out there. COVID is real, and I've, I've, I have a sneaky suspicion that if we don't do some more things ourselves to keep the numbers down, keep specifically the, hospitaliz the hospitalizations down, that we're going to see some stricter mandates coming out of the governor's office ahead of the holidays. And I don't want to be right on that. I hope I'm wrong. But one thing we can do is be socially distant, wear a mask whenever it's feasible for you to do so, and wash your hands. Um, just Merry Christmas and stay safe, folks. You. I also uh, welcome back uh, Commissioner Shuto and Commissioner Eford, but I also uh, am thankful for the commissioners that I've been serving with for the last two years, and uh, we we have an additional two years I think, to go before our terms come up, and uh, Commissioner Shuto and. Commissioner Eford, y'all got four years. And I can tell you as a commissioner, I'm entering into my seventh year. Uh, I do think that the commissioners on this board are concerned about all the citizens in Stanley County. And I think when we spend tax dollars, I think we all think about, hey, this is some of my dollars, some of my neighbor's dollars people I know and I want us to do the right things and build the county as great as we can build it because we do have the greatest county in the state of North Carolina. I think so. Uh, we're located in the central Piedmont and we're close to a lot of great things. But Stanley County is a great county. I enjoy working with our county manager, our uh, clerk, Ms. Brummett, and our legal counsel, Ms. Furr, and all the associates that we work with. And I wish all the associates of the county a Merry Christmas, keep them safe, and a Merry Christmas to this board. And uh, I look forward to working with this board this, for the next couple of years. At this time, we need to uh, go into a closed session to discuss economic development issues in accordance with General Statute 143-318.11A4 and a real estate property transaction in accordance with General Statute 143-318.11A5. Do I have a motion to go in closed session? Okay, who made the motion? Back, okay. Uh, so we're going into closed session. Partnership meeting. Yeah. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. <laughs>